Welcome everyone to the Globalism panel at this year's Friedman Conference. Uh, as you may have seen in your programs, this panel is sponsored by IGO Watch. You may have seen our stress balls lying around the entire venue. If you found one, please take one. Uh, Tim Andrews actually su suggested that I should just take a bunch of balls and start throwing them in the audience. I don't think that's the best idea. I think that the hide and seek and finding them around is much more interesting. But as I said, we are the sponsors of this event, so we hope you're going to enjoy our talks. But before we begin, I have an important announcement. A little bit later, after the afternoon breaks, we're going to be having a group photo when we make all the rooms into one for the keynotes. So. Please make sure to stick around after this session ends, at least 15 minutes, because we want all of you in the photos and we hope to have as many people as we can. Well, uh, today I would first like to start by introducing our panelists. First off, we have Monica Wilkie, who works as a policy analyst at the Center for Inter Independent Studies in Sydney. She has a Bachelor of Arts in English and History from the University of Newcastle and a Master of Media Practice from the University of Sydney. Uh, she has written extensively as a media analyst uh, where she was responsible for providing analysis to a variety of government and private sector clients. And while studying her master's, Monica was a part of a university initiative which uh, covered the 2016 federal elections. Monica has a passion for modern history and political philosophy. After that, we have Ross Marchant, who is the policy director at the DC-based Taxpayer Protection Alliance. Uh, Ross, uh, Ross Marchant, sorry, I'm used to calling him Ross because I work with him. Uh, Ross is a director of policy for uh, TPA. He's an alumnus of the Mercatus Center MA Fellowship at George Mason University. Uh, he has interned for the Texas Public Policy Foundation and the American Legislative Exchange Council, where he analyzed and blogged on a variety of public policy issues, ranging from higher education to fiscal policy. Uh, his current research interests include uh, disability insurance reform and the role of state-level liability structure in abating environmental contamination, as well as his, his extensive covering of the IGOs worldwide. Uh, his work has appeared in numerous publications, including Wall Street Journal, Forbes, the Denver Post, and the Washington Examiner. And lastly, we have John O'Connell, who is the chief executive of the British Taxpayers Alliance and the newly elected chairman of the World's Taxpayers Association. John, I'm pretty sure that you're sick of people congratulating you, but I want to do it just again. Uh, uh, John was a researcher and later research director at TPA. He wrote major reports on a government capital procurement, regional business policy, and local government pensions. And John also oversaw the work of the 2020 <laughs> Tax Commission, and he also wrote and edited several sections of the final report, The Single Income Tax, which won the Templeton Freedom Award from the Atlas Network. Uh, he has a BA from Nottingham Trent University and an MSc from University College in London. Uh, my name is Marco. I'm the global coordinator at IGO Watch, and this session's topic is very, very broadly defined as globalism, but the thing that we would like to discuss at this session is how the international governmental organizations like the United Nations or the European Union actually undermine democracy and accountability and how those organizations and the international conventions they produce impact are, well, impact the domestic laws of countries worldwide. And because a lot of the domestic laws are implemented and justified out of the country's need to actually fulfill their uh, international obligations. And I know that the other speakers will uh, speak in more detail about these issues, but what I actually am here to talk about briefly is the IGO Watch project. IGO Watch project was founded in uh, mid-2018 by the Taxpayers Protection Alliance in DC, and it was founded by a number of other organizations worldwide as well. And what actually IGO Watch is, is a watchdog organization that has a task to closely monitor and inspect the work of a large number of international governmental organizations or shortened IGOs. And when we speak about international organizations, many people first think of the EU or the UN, but there are actually dozens if not hundreds of international organizations that receive hundreds of millions, even billions of taxpayer dollars, and generally either use it to promote their vested radical leftist agenda or just flat out waste it. And up until now, there really hasn't been that much scrutiny 
of these organizations in any constant framework. And there are a few watchdog organizations that uh, follow the work of certain IGOs, but most of them just focus on certain themes or issues that are pertaining to their own field of work. And IGO Watch has been used to point out these examples of taxpayer fund wasting and to call for more transparency, to call for accountability, and to call these organizations out when they're betraying their core missions. So, for instance, we have the World Health Organization, which is probably our favorite and not for the good reasons. And the WHO is a part of the United Nations system, and it just, just doesn't seem to fall off our radar any time. Because with numerous examples of money-wasting scandals and unscientific policy decisions. So, Although it was founded with pretty good aims, they have completely lost the plot in recent years. On one hand, their spending and their waste is out of control. Uh, to use just one example, uh, on one hand, they spend close to $30,000 per employee per year only on travel. So that's $30,000. Now, when you compare that to a similar group like Doctors Without Borders, they actually spend around uh, $1,000 annually per employee which is an organization that actually does a lot more on the ground work. So that's a total of $20 million on travel spent in 2017 only, which is more than the World Health Organization spends on battling AIDS, hepatitis, mental health issues, and substance abuse combined. And according to the most recent information, which we got last week, they have managed to spend 4% less on business class flights and $1,000 night hotels in 2018, which puts it down to a whopping $190 million. So that's only a part of the problem, the spending, because they have lately become so preoccupied with these ideological obsessions that they have, and they've completely dropped the ball on civil health emergency. So one example is from a few years ago when Ebola broke out in Africa, the WHO leadership actually refused to call the Ebola outbreak a public health emergency for several months, either for political reasons, but also because they were prioritizing their resources at a time for different areas, for marketing is one example, because they were promoting a plain packaging conference in Moscow at the time. So public health emergency in Western Africa lasted for months and months and months before the WHO actually did something about it. And there's the example of North Korea, which is my favorite example, because a few years ago we had the Margaret Chan, who was the leader of the WHO at the time, when she actually praised the North Korean government for their anti-obesity efforts. So basically you have a country with thousands of, hundreds of thousands of people who are on the brink of starvation, and you have the leader of the WHO praising their anti-obesity efforts. And the WHO is just a part of a huge uh, UN system which the global taxpayers tune to the fund of 13 billion, I think, around 13 billion dollars annually. And they are going through a serious credibility crisis in the last few years because what the UN basically does is they support an internal cu culture of freeloading and it really comes as a no surprise because you have a, a UN officials at the very top like Eric Solheim who was the head of the UN Environment Program who was forced to quit because an independent panel investigation actually discovered that he spent around half a million dollars in less than two years on travel alone. And keep in mind this is all public funding, taxpayer dollars that we're speaking about. So that's basically a massive carbon footprint who's for someone who has an agency that preaches that we should all use airplanes less. So he spent 80% of his working days traveling, which also included a weekend first class getaway ticket from New York to Paris and back. And when he was confronted with this data, he simply responded that he cannot be treated as an ordinary worker uh, who sits in his office from nine to five because the rules don't actually apply to him. And you would think, you would expect a harsh response from the UN, but what the Secretary General actually did was actually just praise his contributions to the organization, to the climate change fight and just thanked him for his contributions. So you hear all these, story, these stories all the time. Because one third of the UN staff actually uh, said that they, staff and contractors, said that they experienced sexual harassment in the past two years. And only one out of those three, only one out of the three of those actually say they uh, took any action, any legal action after experiencing sexual harassment. So this is no wonder because the way UN deals with these issues is by having non-transparent internal investigations. So the United Nations has no uh, uniform standard when criminal allegations against its staff, criminal allegations of sexual abuse are lodged against its staff. So 
In sexual abuse cases, the UN routinely misapplies immunity in order to hinder police investigation. Uh, the only recent time that we discovered that they had to react is when a high-ranking uh, UN women official was accused by at least eight young men of serious and physical sexual harassment. So basically that was the only time that we found out that the UN actually did something. Then you have the head of the UNAIDS who was forced to quit after uh, an internal independent panel actually found out that and I quote, his defective leadership tolerated a culture of harassment, including sexual harassment, bullying, and abuse of power. So when you read all those reports, that bas that's basically what you're going to find in all of the internal investigations. But at least with the UN, the public was actually informed about uh, how their officials spend money and about their travel patterns. And you have on the other side, the EU Court of Justice, which uh, decided last year that the European Parliament has the right to refuse requests for information for their MPs on the ground that releasing the information about the expenses, about travel, uh, would undermine the protection of privacy and the integrity of the individual. And these are all public functions we're talking about. And with all these examples, with all these organizations, our mission is to call these out, to focus on their core mission and to abandon these crazy ideological pursuits. And that's why it's important for us to speak as one voice as taxpayers and why that's why the TPA founded this group, because we're building a network of groups. Right now we have 24 groups in more than 13 countries, and our vision is to actually see these groups growing. So, because some of these groups are only small organizations or one of two individuals, and we want to give them a voice, we want them to be able to talk about all these issues, about the international organizations in all the regions of the world, and our end game is to cut their funding unless they make really serious changes, they're more transparent and more accountable. So we want to provide the information to the groups on the ground. We want to receive feedback about what the IGOs are doing. We want to give them a global voice. We want that to be reported in multiple languages. We want the public to know what's happening. And we want to spread our message, to amplify our message, to expand our global reach, get all the information we can out there, and find ways to get people to speak about these issues, to hear about these issues, and just get the news out to the public. And with that, I would just like to leave the floor to our next speakers, who I know will, be, will speak about different issues in more detail. So whoever wants to go next, feel free. Uh, thank you, Marco. Um, I'm going to talk about the EU, unsurprisingly. Um, and I thought when, when the topic was uh, circulated by email, I thought about it in two ways, really. One was um, in a positive way, you know, Britain leaving the EU um, and Brexit means that Britain can become a more outward-looking country, um, you know, globalism as in global Britain. We can start doing trade deals uh, with other countries around the world. And then, of course, there's the negative sense, which is the dominance of uh, IGOs uh, to start with. But I suppose relevant for both the positive and the negative um, and relevant to the discussion is just a very quick update on, on Brexit because a lot's happened in the last 48 hours. Um, yeah, um, Theresa May has announced a date for her resignation, so uh, great. <laughs> Is that Guy Bentley straight out of the box there? <laughs> uh, so what happens next? Um, well, the leadership race, which has been going on in full view of Theresa May anyway, is now formally um, kicking off. Um, at the moment, it does look like Boris Johnson um, is the, the new favourite. Um, <laughs> So essentially what happens is, um, in the Conservative Party, the rules are that the Parliamentary Party um, put forward two names that go out to the grassroots membership for votes. Now, Boris Johnson's problem has always been that he's very unpopular in the Parliamentary Party. The other MPs simply don't like him at all, um, for a large part. Um, but it's becoming increasingly clear that he could be a galvanising voice, uh, both in terms of going to the EU and telling them to sod off, basically, um, but also in, in, in the event of a general election, um, you know, we, we've got a hardline Marxist um, waiting in the wings to take the keys to number 10. And that has to be forefront, of, uh, forefront in the minds of Conservative MPs as they select uh, the two that go forward. So there will be lots of people who don't like Boris Johnson who will probably hold their nose and, and put him forward anyway. Um, so let's assume it is him. What will he do? Um, he, I, he goes to the EU. Um, he tells them to um, remove the backstop. Um, it's terminology that 
is now common parlance in the UK, but it's a uh, piece of the withdrawal agreement that um, yeah, it, about the uh, border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. So um, he'll go to the EU, he'll talk about the backstop, ask them to get rid of it, and in all likelihood, the EU will hold firm. They'll tell them, they'll, they'll say, no, we're not getting rid of it. Um, and what happens then? Um, given that there's no majority for anything in Parliament, we've been going through the machinations uh, you know, non-stop. Um, there is no majority for absolutely anything in Parliament. Maybe it will be a general election, and maybe it will be before um, the year's out as well. So again, Boris Johnson um, will probably um, have a pitch uh, in that general election saying that he would like to leave with no deal, if at all possible, and given the success of the Brexit party over the last couple of weeks, it's, it's a brand new party. It was formed three weeks ago and it's absolutely killed it at the European election. So they've, they've done fantastically well. Given that, given that success, um, the Conservatives uh, being worried about that success being a long-term drain from the Conservative Party, it would be, um, you know, it, it would be remiss for Boris Johnson to take no deal off the table himself. So I'm sure at a general election he will come... Um, up with a way to say, look, we're, we're going to go to the EU and tell them no deal and walk off. And yeah, I think that would be quite popular. Or in the intervening time, the EU realises that with Boris Johnson at the helm, no deal is a possibility. Um, and they don't want no deal. Uh, that's often forgotten in all of this. You know, we always talk about how no deal would be dreadful for Britain. It would also be dreadful for the EU, and they know that too. So if they got somebody at the helm, you know, with Theresa May, they knew they had somebody who was never going to go for no deal. So, you know, they could toy around with her. But with Boris Johnson, it might not be that easy. So uh, there's an outside chance that they might, given that it's more possible, um, come to some sort of agreement with Boris. Um, not least because they've got Emmanuel Macron now leading the charge. You know, we, 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 our Brexit date was supposed to be March and then it got extended to June. It's now extended to October. Um, the EU were willing to give us a lot longer, but Macron said no. Um, he wanted it to be done uh, over, uh, you know, a lot more quickly. So again, if Macron's uh, uh, as influential as he is at the minute, he wants us gone too. And I agree with him. I want to go as well. Um, but, you know, it, it's a foolish man who makes any predictions in uh, UK politics, probably politics in any country at the moment. You know, we can we work in politics, you know, pretend we know what we're talking about. The truth is we don't. Um, that's a best guess at present. Um, talking to friends in number 10 overnight as well. Um, Boris Johnson does look like uh, the most likely candidate. Um, but going back to IGOs more generally, um, you know, the idea of Global Britain is an exciting one. Um, for me, uh, as a Taxpayers Alliance as well, it's a good opportunity to start cutting taxes as and when we leave the EU. I'm a fan of tax competition. Um, the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, seemed to get this as well when he said, you know, if the EU doesn't do a deal with us, we'll become the Singapore of Europe. He used it as a threat. We're going to become the Singapore of Europe if you don't play ball with us. And, well, if that's such a good idea, why not do it anyway? You know, why use it as a threat? Um, but for me, that's an exciting time because uh, you know, uh, if, we, if Theresa May's deal did pass, um, it would have hampered us a lot on tax. Uh, we, you know, the EU know that we could aggressively cut taxes, undercut them. The City of London's already very powerful anyway. And our economy, after some initial hiccups, probably would have gone gangbusters, and the EU knows that. Um, so they've, uh, you know, in the withdrawal agreement, um, we, we actually had our hands tied quite a lot on taxes. So I want to see no deal so that we can cut taxes immediately and quite aggressively. Um, because the flip side is that the EU is moving towards tax harmonisation. Um, at the moment, uh, for any sort of tax policy, um, it has to be a unanimous, uh, unanimous vote of the Council of Ministers. But at the moment, there is a, a move to try and switch it to qualified majority voting. So that would, you know, the, the Irish are outraged, obviously, with their 12% 12, 12 or 12.5% 12 corporation tax. But this is what the powerful IGOs do. You know, they act in their self-interest and, um, you know, You've got individual countries that will have absolutely no power to say no to what the EU proposes in the future on taxes. Um, we'll, we'll probably cover loads of other stuff, but you know, I, I changed part of my speech because I spoke to Ian Kerr outside, um, who is from Vanuatu, and he told me something absolutely incredible, which was that. Uh, they have very low taxes or no taxes in certain regard in Vanuatu in order to be competitive. But they're being told, instructed by the EU. What's, what's it got to do with the EU, Vanuatu? 
by the EU, the IMF, and forgive me, and I'll, I'll, I'll forget some of them. They're being told that they have to implement, a, you know, higher taxes in their country um, if they want to be considered uh, reasonable partners to deal with. Now, I find that despicable. Um, it's absolutely disgusting, and so you know, signing up for IGO Watch because I'll be signing them up for the World Taxpayers Association. So that's it. That's it for me. I really wanted to give an update on Brexit and you know try and show my disgust at the EU. But there we are. All right. Good day, mates. My name is Ross Marchand. I'm director of policy for the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. I said I would do that. Allow me to explain. The Taxpayers Protection Alliance is a watchdog taxpayer customer group based in Washington, D.C. Our esteemed director, executive director, is Tim Andrews. Now, I asked him for permission to give my speech an Australian accent, and he got very, very ruddy in the face, and he threatened me with murder should I proceed. So let's keep this between us, that I said good day, mate, and that will be the extent of my Australian accent in this speech. I want to talk about product regulation in the European Union, but not just limited to the European Union, cascading effects that could go on on an international scale that could raise product prices and diminish the availability for very, very important products in the EU, in the US, in the UK, in Canada, Australia, and in developing countries around the world as well. Um, so I think that the best way to begin is talking about some of these products that improve, enhance our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. A wide, wide array of products. You're talking about bandages. You're talking about airbags. You're talking about um, CAT scanners. You're talking about the paint that insulates the outside of aircraft. And what do all these things have in common, aside from improving our day-to-day -day life? Well, they have certain substances that form the basis of them, certain ingredients. And they have very, very long, complicated names. And I will try to read these names out loud, but the pronunciation is going to be absolutely terrible. So what we have now is, drum roll please, sorry. You have monohexasilicon, ooh, okay, no. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this. But the thing is, even though you have these products with really long, difficult to pronounce names, they form an umbrella term called silicones. And silicones form the basis of a lot of these products that we hold dear and that we depend on on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's all well and good. But you have these European regulators, and they woke up one morning in 2017, and they said, ah, these names, they're scary sounding. I think that they probably have adverse effects on health and environmental health and unacceptable risks. Therefore, because we don't know too much about them and the name sounds scary, we are going to kickstart a regulatory process where we try to get rid of them and diminish the use of these products. So that started in 2017, and that process is going on now, and that will probably be ratified soon enough, and you'll have European inclusion of these long-sounding names, these scary silicone chemicals, and it's going to be included on a list that's called Substances of Very High Concern. And you have to wonder, what is the science undergirding this designation? Well, that's a really good question, because there is basically no scientific basis for them to smear these products. And it's not like they would really have to go on a limb. It's not like they would have to reinvent the wheel to find some sort of scientific claims or scientific evidence one way or another. In fact, Canada, in 2008, more than 10 years ago, they actually looked at real-world exposure data um, on these substances to see if they have adverse human health effects and adverse environmental effects. And they concluded that, shocker, claims, alarmist claims that they did have adverse impacts are overblown, and the products are perfectly safe for people and perfectly safe for the environment as well. Now, Australia, to their credit, recently in 2018, they soberly assessed the evidence. I'm just kidding, Australians are never sober about anything. And they came to the reasonable conclusion, like their Canadian brethren, hey, there are no adverse human and environmental impacts. So therefore, Canada and Australia made the wise decisions based on actual exposure and real-world scientific data, hey, we're not going to move ahead with regulation of these products. But the European Union regulators, they don't care about real-world evidence. They just care about the burden of proof. And for them, where does the burden of proof lie? It does not lie on themselves to prove a harm. It lies on the producer 
to prove that these products are safe for human consumption and safe for the environment. And that is a very twisted, misguided principle known as the precautionary principle. Now, I wouldn't put it past the European Union. The European Union has been leading the way in terrible, misguided regulation for years. The problem here is that if the European Union succeeds, these regulators succeed in classifying these substances as dangerous, the problem is the United Nations has something called the Stockholm Convention where they take these claims seriously and they can transfer that claim to basically a worldwide prohibition or at the very least a series of worldwide restrictions. Now the Stockholm Convention has been doing this for years and um, very, very close to their inception around 20 years ago, they did this for something called DDT, which is a famous anti-malarial agent. It was used successfully for years, in Africa especially, to eradicate malaria. But then environmentalists got loud, and they started claiming, hey, this had adverse environmental and human effects. And therefore, the lefties and the environmentalists, they sounded the alarm, and they told the United Nations, and through the Stockholm Convention, this product was seriously reduced and almost regulated out of existence. Now, to their credit, Almost 10 years after that, the Stockholm Convention changed their mind and they said, yeah, no, this DDT is actually pretty important to eradicating malaria, so we are going to partially reverse our restrictions on the developing world. But by then, if you wait 10 years to reverse course on such a long, a large standing prohibition, the damage is already done. And lives that you could have saved over that 10 year period, the first decade of the 2000s, those potential gains are never going to be realized. So we don't want the key substances undergirding the products that we depend upon on a day-to-day -day basis to be subject to the same sort of fear-mongering and hysteria and global prohibition as to what happened to DDT. But listen, I like to be cautiously optimistic. I wouldn't put it past the UN and the Stockholm Convention to do crazy, irrational things and maybe or maybe not change their minds later. The World Health Organization is a really good example of what happens when regulators are stupid and hysterical and use the precautionary principle. Um, they recently released this report at the end of last year saying, oh, safe drinking, moderate beer, and wine consumption? No, 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 that's crazy. That's a total myth. Even though study after study indicates that it is safe. And you see the same thing with reduced risk um, vaping products, they use the precautionary principle once again. And they say, yeah, um, it's probably not safe. We're just going to quote unquote veer on the side of caution and we're going to either ban or regulate it significantly until evidence indicates otherwise. Which by the way, that is a heck of a caveat because it's never going to be fulfilled if you are risk averse enough and you rely on the precautionary principle as these international bureaucracies are wont to do. So what I would say is this. Don't listen to these global bureaucracies in their fear peddling and hysteria. And we need to make sure that we have sound governance that is not based on precautionary principle, but rather permiss permissionless innovation that gives producers the benefit of the doubt and gives customers the benefit of the doubt. And until there is actual real world exposure driven scientific evidence that these products are not safe, veer on the side of freedom and give people a choice. But this starts at the national level. This does not start at the international level. We need to make sure that national regulatory bodies are doing their due diligence and veering on the side of freedom and veering on the side of customers having maximum safe choices and making sure that if national regulatory making goes awry, it does not cascade into a huge problematic international um, prohibition. So I wrote an op-ed about a month ago on the silicone product issue. Um, it's in Town Hall, and uh, my coworker just posted it on the community, I think it's called the, the WOVA app? Hoover. The Whova app, okay. Uh, so you could all find it there, and if you have any questions or you want to hear my Australian accent, please see me, but after this event. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Uh, I think after that attempt at an Australian accent, I don't like your chances of being invited back. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out to hear this talk this afternoon. This is my first time speaking at Friedman, and I'm delighted to receive the invitation, and I appreciate you all coming here. So what I'm going to do to bring home the discussion this afternoon is I'm going to talk about how various UN conventions affect domestic policy in Australia. And I'm going to do this in a very specific way, by using the example of hate speech laws. 
So why am I going to do this? Last year, I embarked on a research project into hate speech laws in Australia. This began because in the middle of last year, New South Wales introduced the Publicly Threatening and Inciting Violence Bill 2018. So I started researching this. I read the bill, I read the Hansard, the debates, the discussions about it, and a phrase jumped out at me. They said, we need to introduce this bill in part to fulfill our international obligations. That stuck in my mind. So I went back. That bill was a result of various other legislations that have built up over time. There was one in 2016, there was one before that. So I looked through various of these documents and the phrase, we need this to fulfill our international obligations, kept coming up. I ended up going all the way back to 1989 when the first anti-vilification laws in Australia were being introduced. The Honourable John Dowd, who was then the New South Wales Attorney General, said anti-vilification laws need to do four things. Provide clear civil and criminal provisions, provide a deterrent function, provide a symbolic and educative function, and ensure Australia abides our international human rights obligations to protect free speech and punish hate speech. There it was again. So I decided to go to the federal level. In the early 90s, the Keating government reintroduced the Racial Hatred Act. In 1994, the Racial Hatred Bill, which would ultimately become Section 18C. I was wondering if that would get a boo. <laughs> Probably in the free speech one then. Thank you very much. So then I went back even further and ended up at the Racial Discrimination Bill 1973. And then Attorney General Lionel Murphy had a quote. He said, one of the greatest achievements of the UN that these concepts, equality, human dignity, have been developed in a series of comprehensive international instruments. So after reading three decades of Hansard documents, I noticed a pattern. We had to do these things in part to fulfill our international obligations to prevent racial discrimination. So what exactly were our obligations? There are two main covenants that we are signatories to, or that Australia is a signatory to. One is the International Covenant on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So what are these? The ICERD says we must declare an offence punishable by law or dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority or hatred incitement to racial discrimination. The ICCPR has various articles and paragraphs, so I'll just, I'll just um, briefly state what that is. It reasserts the right everyone has to free speech, regardless of frontiers, and it asserts this freedom with special duties, allowing for speech restrictions provided and necessary by law. Article 20 prohibits war propaganda and the advocacy of national, racial or religious hatred, hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility or violence so shall be prohibited by law. So I found the culprits to these international obligations. So I'd answered one question, the where. Now I had to answer the why. In 1960s, Germany was experiencing an increase in anti-Semitic violence. There was international pressure to fight, to fight colonialism in Southeast Asia and Africa and apartheid. The UN decided something had to be done. And the most interesting aspects of the ICERD and the ICCPR, which ends up being the UN alphabet word salad that I have to get my head around, the most interesting aspects of these for me was not the end result. It was the drafting process that got there. So how did countries as disparate as the Soviet Union, Australia, the UK, come together to agree on conventions prohibiting racial discrimination? So uh, whether surprising or unsurprisingly, there were a few bumps along the way in this process. So the ICCPR was highly controversial. Liberal democracies and communist countries were deciding how best to punish and prohibit hate speech. Incitement to violence has long been a restriction in liberal democracies and various other countries. The Soviet Union-led countries felt this did not go far enough. They wanted to expand to include incitement to hatred. Their argument was that incitement to violence didn't tackle the root of evil. Representatives from Poland said freedom of expression could be abused and contribute decisively to the elimination of all freedoms and rights. Just in case you'd miss that, I'll reiterate it that they were saying freedom of expression was bad for rights, not the other way around. 
the representatives from Yugoslav said we need to suppress manifestations of hatred which even without leading to violence constituted a degradation of human dignity and a violation of human rights. Once again, the argument was free speech was too dangerous. They invoked the memory of World War II for the justification of this, saying, look what happened mere, mere decades before. We have to stop this happening again. We have to quell free speech, otherwise this is going to happen again. A common argument. But what were the opponents of Article 20 to the ICCPR saying? Eleanor Roosevelt in the 1940s, when the United Nations was being established, foreshadowed some concerns. She thought hatred and hostility was extremely dangerous to include in any restrictions of free speech and warned provisions would encourage governments to punish all criticism under the guise of protecting against religious and national hostility. At the time, Australia warned people could not be legislated into morality. A fantastic phrase that I think the politicians should use more. Australia was so concerned about the negative impact on free expression that we inserted reservations into both the ICCPR and the ICERD, reservations that persist to this day and which the union insists that we remove. So during this process, the UK representative said the power of democracy to combat propaganda lay in the ability of its citizens to arrive at reasoned decisions in the face of conflicting appeals. A similar story happened during the drafting of the ICERD. Article 4 says we shall declare an offence punishable by law or dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority, hatred, incitement to racial discrimination. They had a lovely caveat which was filled with due regard to free expression. I think that would probably be uh, up to interpretation what that means. So the ICERD goes even further than the ICCPR as it doesn't simply prohibit hate speech, it criminalises it. Once again, the drafting process is telling. Article 4 of the ICERD was based on a Soviet-Polish proposal, which, which suggested that we prohibit and disband racist, fascist and any other organisation practising or inciting racial discrimination. Western countries were strongly opposed. The representative from Colombia said this was a throwback to a past, punishing ideas, abating tyranny, and could end in disaster. So there was a clear pattern emerging between the communist countries and liberal democracies. The argument simply went that liberal democracy said, yes, free speech can lead to some negative consequences, but it's often worse if you try and restrict it. The communist countries were arguing the opposite. So after a lengthy debate and several visions, the ICERD and the ICCPR were adapted and ratified. A similar process occurred during the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A main question that they were asking when they were talking about the limits of free speech was how tolerant should we be of intolerance? Communist countries were once again arguing for greater restrictions on free speech, liberal democracies, more freedoms. There's a, a very lengthy process involved in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I think I read something like 20,000 pages of drafting documents over the last six months. It doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But please, if you're interested, feel free to come up to me over the next day and the half if you're a, a history nerd like I am. It's a very interesting, interesting process. But Eleanor Roosevelt who earlier expressed her concerns about restrictions, by 1949 regretted the inclusion of broad language in terms of free streets restrictions because repressive regimes in Hungary, Bulgaria and Romania were already using the peace treaties to justify restrictions. So she said that in 1949, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came into effect in 10th December 1948. It didn't take that long for the negative consequences to materialise. So why is it important to discuss this? Bodies like the UN and conventions can often seem amorphous. They're on the other side of the world. They're these, they're these big bodies. You can't always see the effects. It can seem like, well, what's the big deal? Aren't they nice? They're just over there talking about human rights. But every single hate speech law introduced in Australia at the state and federal level has in part been justified 
but the need to fulfil our international obligations. And as I just outlined, those obligations possibly have some slight flaws in them. These UN conventions matter. What happens at the UNHQ can and does influence our laws. Thank you, and I look forward to taking your questions. And uh, we also got some questions, some good questions, actually. Uh, so let's get to it. Uh, first question for Monica, because your presentation is probably the freshest. Uh, do you think that there is a fine line between racial abuse, hatred, and free speech? And if yes, how do we determine it, or do we determine it at all? Yeah, sure. Is this on? Can people hear? Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, it's a good question, and it's an important question. And as I found in my research, it's something that they've been asking since the UN was formed in 1945. I have a pretty much the same attitude towards hate speech in that incitement to violence has always been unlawful and that's a pretty good limitation in my opinion because you're talking about not just words or offence, something that actually has an action, a consequence to it. So I do think that's a pretty good line. The second you go beyond that and start talking about inciting discrimination, hostility, you have to decide what are the definitions of those and who is going to determine what those definitions are. And as history shows time and time again, I mean, my, my research went back 70 years to the formation of the UN. These discussions go back. Well, that, it, the second you step outside the bounds of incitement to violence, you will create an environment for censorship. Thank you. And we also have a question for all the panelists. So the question states, uh, IGOs sometimes undermine democratic, democratic politics, but this can have good results given libertarian principles. For example, organizations like Fides, PIS, and Syriza would be much more worse were it not for the EU. Institutions like the EU also distribute political power across competing institutions. Libertarians made these arguments during the Brexit debate. What do the panelists make of them? If I may. Sure. There are undoubtedly good um, efforts and intentions by organizations like the WHO and the UN. You heard it here first. But it is a question of good, all of the good versus all of the bad. And if you look at the full breadth of things like the UN and, and sub-agencies like the WHO, I think that the net good does not even come close to matching the net bad. And you look at, for example, the impact alone of UN peacekeeping operations and the humanitarian catastrophe that comes with it, I mean, that alone probably negates most of the positives that come from organizations like the United Nations and with the WHO. I mean, all their anti-vaping and anti-safe, um, moderate drinking activities and proposed product regulations, I mean, that alone, I think, more than offsets any sort of positive, minuscule contributions um, made by this and similar um, organizations. <laughs> Thank you, Ross. Sorry, can I just um, on of that? Course, just of course, of course. If you have anything stuff. to add, feel free. Just uh, one, of, one of my favorite stories about sort of perverse effects of things is um, Greenpeace has had a long-standing objection to genetically modified food and people you tend to think genetically modified food then they're doing crazy things to the food that are, are bad but there's this rice called golden rice and what they do is they modify it so it can grow in parts of Africa that are not not natural to it and they, they estimate that if they were allowed to grow this golden rice, it could save up to 2 million lives a year. But because it's classed as genetically modified food under various definitions that organisations like Greenpeace that I've lobbied for, it's outlawed. So it could save 2 million lives, but because it has that label. It's just, that's a story I just like to tell, to put it in perspective. Thank you. Uh, now we have a question that I think it's mostly directed towards John. So... Uh, how do you think future relationship with Ireland and re-emergence of the Scottish independence question after UK, EU, and by extension globalism in case of a no-deal Brexit? Um, is this on? Can people yeah. hear? Um, so the Scotland issue is interesting. I have no conception in my mind of why they would want to leave 
the union they're currently in, the United Kingdom, to join another union independently. Um, but the politics are interesting as well. Um, I, at the moment, there's a real feeling in, in Scotland that the Scottish nationals don't actually want a referendum. Um, they feel like that they would lose, that there's a bit of election fatigue on at the minute, but because that is their whole reason of being is to get Scottish independence, that they have to keep pretending that they want one anyway. Um, the other interesting element is if Jeremy Corbyn does need the Scottish nationals uh, in order to form a government, um, that would force them into having a referendum and then Jeremy Corbyn would then be blamed for Scotland leaving the Union. So there's a lot of interesting political uh, angles to that. With Ireland, uh, the, the, the thing with Ireland that uh, annoys me is that the, the UK got played like an absolute fiddle in the negotiations. The EU said to us, you've got to sort out the, the issue with the uh, potential Irish border. Now, in my mind, we, if the UK says, look, we're not going to put a border up, then if a border does go up, by definition, it's the EU that's putting the border up, not us. And, and we were made to own that issue um, by the EU. And the negotiating team were you know, terrible, frankly. But um, what, what would happen in a no-deal Brexit? Um, very good question. That's what the civil service is there to do. Uh, but they've been told that they should stop for preparations for a no-deal Brexit because you know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to get through Parliament. But that's exactly what the civil service could and should be doing throughout this entire process, is preparing us properly for a no-deal Brexit. Thank you. Uh, so now we have a question for Ross. Uh, do you feel that the US is less restricted by or cares less about IGOs than other similar countries throughout the world? And I also think that the other speakers, speakers can further talk about that the relationship of the governments in their rel relative countries to IGOs like the UN or some other, sure. if you have any interesting examples, you can further elaborate on that. Sure. I, I do think that the U.S. cares a lot less because they feel like it impacts them, it, particularly in an immediate sense, a lot less than, let's say, European countries. European countries, each and every day, have to deal with absurd, ridiculous uh, EU regulations. And I think Asia and Africa have to constantly deal with uh, UN peacekeeping operations. They may see peacekeepers every day. The US is not gonna have that direct exposure, but I would argue that over the long term, um, these IGOs and their insane regulations impact the US uh, more directly than they do a lot of other places because the US has a regulatory, a uh, fairly light uh, footprint, and I think that relative to a lot of other countries, um, we exhibit pretty good regulatory cost-benefit analysis. So if we go from having our national regulatory uh, system to having a regulatory system dictated by IGOs, then you're seeing a decent, fairly light-touch regulatory framework, particularly under this administration, by the way, uh, supplanted by an insane uh, regulatory apparatus dictated by the precautionary principle. Because Precautionary principle is something that is fairly common in Europe and in EU countries, but not so much in the United States. So, Americans, watch out, just like everyone else, watch out. Uh, Australians have this very unhealthy obsession that I can't understand with making sure the world likes us. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, so every time the UN says Australia is doing something naughty or some other organisation says we're doing something naughty, we tend to have a bit of an, an overreaction and say, oh, this must be fixed immediately because the international community is, is upset. And the phrase that's used a lot in Australia is we need to be international leaders. I mean, I, I love Australia, but I... I question how many countries are looking at what we're doing <laughs> a lot of the time. So I, I often envy the uh, US's approach to these things. I mean, just recently there was a um, round table held in Paris about social media extremism, hate speech and violence after in the wake of Christchurch. And there was, a, there was representatives from all, all over. Um, Theresa May was there. I, I feel like maybe she could found something better to do. So then they all signed up to this, you know, pledge saying that we will we um, will combat hate speech and extremism online and all this sort of stuff. And then they all applauded themselves and America just went, no, thanks, moved on. So I, I, th I think there's, there's scope in Australia to have a more healthy relationship with bodies like the UN. Um, 
two very quick points. One is that it's similar to um, at Monica's in many ways in that um, the UK, um, when the EU passes regulations, the UK doesn't just take those regulations, we gold plate them. We, we, we really, really put those regulations into practice. And actually other countries within the EU, Germany, France and Italy, they just flout whatever regulations they damn well please. And, you know, that's obviously, you know, given the position we're in now where the Germans and French are telling us what to do, that, that seems to be, um, you know, uh, well, bonkers really. But um, an, an, another non-EU point, which is great. Um, the World Health Organization. Um, in the UK, Public Health England, which is uh, an organization, uh, you know, part of the NHS, that looks after public health, they're actually really good on vaping. They have answered the question, does it save lives? Yeah, well, therefore, let's leave it alone. Um, and they've been relatively sensible in it. They're, they're obviously nuts on everything else, like sugar taxes, um, you know, banning offers in supermarkets, all this kind of stuff. So they're, they're, they're rubbish on most things, but on vaping, they've got it spot on. The worry in the UK, though, is that um, what World Health Organization uh, releases guidance sometimes ends up becoming law. Um, so there's a real uh, sense that we need to fight back against what the WHO are saying on that, that type of issue, given that for once we managed to get it right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now we have a question for Ross. Uh, so silicon is hardly degradable, mainly in water. It is dangerous for organisms in water. It affects their reproduction negatively. Lots of silicon is, for example, in shampoos and this gets flushed into the water system, and it's not becoming uh, into water, and it's not becoming less obviously. So, why are you saying it ain't dangerous? In studies, D4 and and D5 also cause cancer in animals. Do you have a comment which we would like to add? Sure, sure, sure. You have this sort of weird seeming contradiction, in that by almost all accounts, silicone is hardly biodegradable. That is certainly true. But yet, in all the Canadian real-world scientific evidence collected, there was basically no evidence of any uh, water contamination or, indeed, any wider environmental contamination. Why is that? Well, biodegradability is only a small part of the puzzle. If you properly dispose of it, or at least don't just wantonly discard it, then you're not going to have that downstream um, contamination. And in fact, an Oxford University study from a few years ago found that countries like the US, um, EU countries, Canada, are really decent in properly disposing of things. Um, I would say in this case too, the question you always, always have to ask when promulgating regulations is compared to what? It is a lot, silicones are a lot more durable and a lot more easily recyclable than a lot of plastics that would be the competitor products. So in a lot of cases, if you get rid of silicone or make silicone more difficult to come by, it will be replaced by products that are even less biodegradable and are recycled even less easily. So I need to tell all regulators with a national and international level, always examine the unintended consequences of your regulations in addition to examining real world data. Well, also when it comes to interna uh, well, the international regulations of dangerous substances, uh, could you elaborate a bit further on how the UN agency, the IRC, classifies substances as uh, cancerous? Oh, wow, that's a fun one. That's a rabbit hole. Okay, so you have this sub-agency of the World Health Organization, and it's called the International Agency for the Research of Cancer and they are tasked with examining substances and figuring out whether or not they are carcinogenic. And basically they've never found a carcinogeneity finding that they didn't like. They've examined thousands of substances since the 60s, I think they're from the 60s, and all but one were classified as probably not carcinogenic to people. They have um, scholars that have a vested interest basically in confirming their own, their own work and not peer reviewing or being peer reviewed. So of course, they're just gonna embrace their own conclusions. And they're really, really afraid of, God forbid, they find that something is probably not carcinogenic, then if it's found to be carcinogenic, then heads are going to roll. But to give you an idea of how crazy they are, they classify bacon as being in the same level of cancer causing as plutonium. And they said for years that coffee probably caused cancer. Coffee is not, I mean, I drink coffee 
for the buzz. I don't think it tastes that good. It probably doesn't cause cancer. And in fact, studies over the years, meta-analyses, analyses have found very important protective effects against cancer. All of that didn't really sway them. It took three decades for them to tow a softer line on it. And even then they said, yeah, we don't know. We're not really sure one way or another uh, whether or not coffee causes cancer. They refused to do the intellectually honest and braver thing and say, well, actually studies say it has important protective effects against cancer. So don't trust the WHO, don't trust IARC, and don't trust the UN. I'm Jewish, I'm not supposed to be not, right? You can eat bacon if you want, so if you're not Jewish. <laughs> uh, I think that now we can move to questions from the audience, if there are any. Just raise your hand. Can we get a mic? Uh, I'd just like to ask our English visitor, do you think... Oh, right here. Do you think Ireland will leave the EU? No. Um, I th Ireland is very pro-EU. It's one of the most pro-EU countries uh, there is. Um, however, that could quite easily change if plans for tax harmonisation um, escalate in the way they currently are, because Ireland's big USP is that they've got a very, very low corporate tax rate. Um, alongside that, that means uh, you know, Google, Apple and other big companies have set up offices in Dublin. Um, Ireland has always had a problem with um, young workers going overseas. Uh, they've always had massive emigration issues. Um, they're now retaining their talent. Um, that's down to inward investment. That's down to big companies um, being there. Um, so if the EU went aggressively down the tax harmonisation route, then maybe. But currently at present, um, particularly with the, the leadership and Leo Varadkar, the T-shirt there, uh, I, it doesn't look likely. However... If this EU idea of uh, qualified majority voting for tax harmonisation happens, that could very, very, very quickly change. Do we still have time? Just, yeah, yeah, we have time. Just uh, because the door's been opened and I can't get enough of Brexit, uh, we were discussing this last night. Is it, is it too little, too late for Boris? Was the term for Boris three years ago? Oh, well, um, it's not too little, too late for him. Um, it almost is, to be honest. Um, I think that um, the Brexit party have done serious, serious damage to the Conservatives um, and it really needs uh, somebody with energy and optimism and he is about the only... I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Boris, by the way, uh, in, you know, in the big picture sense. I agree, disagree with him on, on a lot. But what we certainly need is a dose of smiley, happy optimism that Britain's actually not going to hell in a handcart, that it is a country that can... Uh, survive on its own, stand on its own two feet, trade with the rest of the world, you know, and have a thriving um, city of London, thriving manufacturer sector, and Boris is the man that can do that. Um, a bit earlier would have been nice. Uh, we have a question in the back. Uh, while we wait for the mic, I would just like to remind you that uh, after this session, we're going to have a short break, and I would like for you all, if you could just uh, be here before, because after that break, we're going to have a group photo in the large room just before the uh, keynote session starts. So please hang around. It will be only 20 minutes, and let's have a group photo with as many bunch of us as we can. Okay, next question. I mean, another question on Boris Johnson. <laughs> if you think he can be a leader... I want to read out the following that The Economist wrote. In a big field, there was one outstanding candidate. He felt miserably as a foreign secretary. He snipped at Mrs. May while in cabinet. He has agitated against her deal from the backbenches and has looked at newspaper column without presenting a real alternative. A demagogue, not a statesman. He is the most irresponsible politician the country has seen for many years. You're reading that from The Economist, though. The Economist has completely lost its mind. Uh, as has the Financial Times over Brexit. There is no like, straight reporting happening on that issue at all from The Economist or the FT. Um, but is it false? Sorry? Is it untrue? Is it, sorry? Do you think that's untrue? Though? I mean, yeah, yeah, I do, th I do think that that is... A, well, untrue, I think, is a huge exaggeration. I don't think he was a successful Foreign Secretary by any means, but I don't think he's... 
what was it in the most irresponsible politician something 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 I, I think that's a wild over exaggeration I think that he's a, a sort of uh, a hate figure for Remainers that's understandable I understand that but you know the economist and the FT have completely lost their marbles on Brexit unfortunately because they report so well on all, most other issues um, you know, to the extent that the FT are now sort of half flirting with the idea of Jeremy Corbyn being okay, it's, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, can we have one more question? Do we have time? Uh, re real quick question, if you can. I mean, they know, right? There, there are seven percent of the European polls for uh, the European election. They're behind the Brexit party for Westminster, three polls in a row now, and they're only one point behind Labour. So if you're concerned about Jeremy Corbyn taking over, doesn't it make more sense for Conservatives just to all break for a Brexit party? The problem with that is that the Brexit party therefore needs to have an agenda other than Brexit. Um, and at the moment, they, they are categorically saying that they don't have any other agenda. In fact, that they're not going to talk about any other policy except for Brexit. So if they're going to run a new... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not, but... Not, not Right, yeah. Okay, so how does Brexit how does the Brexit party resolve the issue of having very hardcore Labour supporters on one side and free marketeer libertarians on the other? What is their policy on the NHS in that regard? What is the policy on the economy, on fiscal policy? It it's working very well in the European sense and it's focused minds and sharpened minds, but as a long term bet, I, I'm not sure it could reconcile two very, very disparate wings. I don't think there's the same contradictions inside. Do you not think there's exactly the same contradictions if not even worse inside the Conservative Party? Not worse. There are contradictions, but I don't think there. Are, I, I think the, the Labour heartlands in the north. You're talking about, you know, old-style socialists that want out of the EU because they think it's a, a, a capitalist project, right? And then you've got, well, you've got free marketeers oh. who think it's a status project. So I, I think I think reconciling those over a domestic agenda is quite difficult. Uh, sorry, but I have to interrupt the discussion because we ran out of time. Feel free to continue with the discussion during the tea break. And I'd like to thank all the panelists, TPA, IG Watch, for sponsoring this session. See you soon for the group photo.